Good morning or good afternoon, everyone, um, depending on what part of the world you are right now. Welcome to this special event on the European Green Deal, the first of the European Union's farm to fork strategy and biodiversity strategy to build healthy and sustainable food systems. I am Valeria Pinedo, Senior Research Fellow, Senior Research Coordinator here at IFPRI, and I will be moderating this event. We would like to thank the European Commission for co-organizing this event with us and you for joining this virtual event live. And last, a big thank you to those of you who are watching this recording after the event. Also, we would like to hear from you to, partic to participate in our Q&A session that will follow the brief presentations and discussion. Please submit your questions on ifpre.org, Facebook, LinkedIn, YouTube, or by using hashtag AskIFPRI on Twitter. The COVID-19 pandemic has underlined the importance of a robust and resilient food system that functions in all circumstances and is capable of ensuring access to affordable food. It has also highlighted the interrelations between health, ecosystems, supply chains, consumption preferences, and planetary boundaries. We need to think of strategies that will prepare us for to deal with future crises. The farm to fork and biodiversity strategies could play a role in achieving this objective by signaling the right incentives to tackle some current inefficiencies, like for example, food loss and waste, reduction in the use of chemical pesticides, healthier soils, more land under organic production and food labeling to facilitate nutrition information to consumers while supporting the transition by investing in research, innovation, technology, and investment. This seminar will discuss these topics in detail. The panelists will give a short presentation followed by a conversation and leaving the last 20 minutes for a Q&A. I would like to start this seminar introducing Jo Swinen, Director General of IPRI, for some opening remarks. Jo, floor is yours. Thank you very much, Valeria. Uh, it's a great pleasure for IFPRI to host this uh, conference and for me to say a few words as introduction. Uh, from a personal perspective, I've been involved for many years, even decades, when I look back, um, in uh, the, the EU discussion on agriculture and food policy. And so it's a great pleasure to uh, welcome uh, the specialist here to hear about the most recent developments. I also noticed many people in, in the DC area and in the US in general, also in, in North America in general, who are interested in these things because of the extensive trade uh, linkages between the EU and North America. But it's even beyond this region, okay? So it's the OECD countries in general and also the developing world, especially African countries, who will be heavily affected through what is being discussed today because they are connected through the EU both through trade, global value chain, foreign investment, but also through regulatory spillovers, which may be affected by these decisions. And of course, globally, the EU and its regulations have a major impact on, on agri-food trade in general, climate change, and sustainable development, which uh, includes biodiversity. The topic of today obviously relates closely to our work at IFPRI. As you know, our 2020 global food policy um, report was on building inclusive food systems, an issue which is closely related what, what I think the speakers today will talk about, touching on many of the interests such as nutrition, health, gender, smallholder or farmed integration in general, sustainability, resilience, etc. Our current work on COVID-19 relates to many of these issues and I think we will come back to that both in the discussion and in the Q&A session. We need healthy and sustainable food systems. They need to be resilient and inclusive more than ever, I would say, today. It's a very impressive panel that we have here today. We have very senior officials on the panel uh, from the European Commission, and they come from three different directorates, from the, the DG of Agriculture, from uh, Health and Food Safety, and from Environment. Their combined perspectives will give us great insight about what is going on in their fields. But even more importantly, I think, and in a way quite unique, the fact that we have all three of them together on this panel will allow us to understand how these policies will interact or will be integrated in this broader European Green Deal. I think the timing could not have been, could not have been better for this panel. There are major new initiatives in each of these three areas that will be discussed today. We have the farm to fork strategy and the EU biodiversity, both are new, forward-looking 
And so uh, the decision there have been made very recently. Then there is the reform of the common agricultural policy where the, the reform discussions have been going on for several years now, but the final conclusions of the reform decisions always have to wait on the financial package, which uh, seem to historically seem to have to precede the final conclusions. And this came through this week. So this week, there was a major decision on financing of the future EU policies and strategies. More than 2 trillion US dollars will be spent in the coming years of which 1.3 trillion US dollars roughly will be under the so-called multi-annual, sorry, multi-annual financial framework, which is really the framework, the budgetary framework, which sets uh, the guidelines or the conditions that how money can be spent on some of the policies we will discuss today. And so I, one expects that now this framework is set that the cap reform discussions may go fast and also reach a conclusion there in the coming uh, months. So this conference could not have been organized at a more at a better time. And I really look forward to the presentations and to the discussions. Back to you, Valeria. Thank you very much for your um, introductory remarks. And uh, I would like to introduce now our first speaker, uh, Sabine Ulicher, Director of Food and Feed Safety, Director General for Health and Food Safety, the European Commission. Sabine, the floor is yours. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, everybody, first of all, for the great welcome. Good morning, good afternoon, um, depending on the case. Um, now, thank you very much for this opportunity that uh, we have to discuss with, with you, with IFPRI, um, the latest developments that we have here in the European Union concerning policies around food. Um, I would like to say a couple of words about the um, uh, farm to fork strategy, um, which is really focused um, on our way forward, on our transition to creating a fair, a healthy and environmentally friendly food system. Um, this strategy has been recently adopted just on the 20th of May, by the way, together with the biodiversity strategy on which uh, Umberto will speak later. And um, we have to understand that these strategies, these communications, they are part of uh, the European Green Deal, one of the priorities of this commission. And the European Green Deal sets out um, the, the way forward to make Europe a climate neutral continent by 2050. Um, at the same time, and you, you can gather this from the timing of the release of these communications, we do see the transition that we are um, departing on in, um, in the Green Deal towards this climate neutral continent. We see that also as part of the recovery um, from the COVID-19 crisis that also struck Europe and is still um, going on. So we see these strategies as an economic opportunity, an economic opportunity for all players that are affected. Now, the Green Deal um, will um, cover quite a number of uh, sectors, for example, mobility, energy, construction, but it covers also the food systems, and that's what you can read and see in the strategy on the farm to fork. So why are food systems there? Obviously, um, in recognition that um, food systems nowadays contribute to some of the negative effects on the climate and on the environment. So they have to contribute um, to the ambitious goals um, set out in the Green Deal. At the same time, um, it is rec recognized that also food systems are um, facing challenges um, through what we have and what we are seeing also in Europe, but also elsewhere in particular, um, challenges through the effects of climate change. We see um, more natural events, natural disaster events. We see the introduction of pests that we didn't have in certain regions of the world, including in Europe. So we do see that uh, the, 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 in particular, the, the climate and the deterioration of the climate change um, has an effect on food systems. Now, 
the strategy sets out challenges, it sets out um, opportunities, and it, it shows what way we envisage for a transition to more sustainable food systems. Now, what is very important in this in these uh, communications in these in this document is that we really um, include all policies that are relevant to food systems and that we include all actors. So we are setting out um, the opportunities, the transition, the challenges along uh, the chain on food production on food processing, wholesale, retail, um, the hospitality sector, but also on consumption, sustainable consumption, healthy consumption, and a shift towards healthy diets. Together with this, we um, see and we emphasize that um, maintaining food safety, maintaining food security, very much reminded during COVID, is, are the cornerstones. They are not, uh, will not be undermined by a shift to more sustainability. Um, and we also take the opportunity to address um, food loss and food waste, a problem that is quite prominent also in Europe and uh, combat food fraud, another occurrence, another issue that we would like to address. Now, what are the overall objectives of this strategy? There are three main objectives, three main um, targets that we have. We would like to end up in a food system that has a neutral or even positive environmental impact um, and preserves and restores the land and sea-based resources, mitigates climate change and adapts to its impact, and reverses the loss of biodiversity. Second, we want a system that ensures food security and public health and provides the opportunity for everybody to have access to sufficient um, nutritious and sustainable food. And lastly, we would like to preserve the affordability of food whilst at the same time generating a fair economic return for all the actors in the food chain. We would like to see fair trade and we would like to see um, occupational health and safety um, preserved as well as the EU internal market. So how do we intend to do that? We have um, an action plan um, with 27 explicitly mentioned actions. As I say, they intend to target all players in the food system. We have flanked these actions with aspirational targets, um, uh, in particular on the use of um, inputs into, into farming, such as the use of pesticides, the use of fertilizers, or the use of antimicrobials, all of which we would like to see reduced. We would like to see an increase in a land under organic farming. And maybe to close at this stage, um, the strategies is really to be understood as the beginning of a process. This, the actions and the and the targets we are setting ourselves, they are there for the for the next decade or so. We know that not everything um, can be done at once, but. A discussion has started within the EU with, with the actors uh, that are um, involved in the topic. We are reaching out to partners globally. We want um, to, to foot ourselves on a broader global base. We start implementing the actions. And uh, as I say, we target all actors along the food chain and obviously as we are beginning a process, we are also ready to review it already in 2023 to see whether we are on the right track, whether we are as efficient as we should be, and whether we should be doing anything else and more. So I'm looking forward to the discussion. I'm looking forward to the questions you may have. And um, for now, I stop here. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sabine, very much. Um for explaining to us uh, the F2F strategy.
and to highlight the main um, characteristic of this strategy that is to look for a way forward and making sure the transition is done and also for the role of the food systems in being part of the solutions to achieve carbon neutrality and having more challenges that, that they face now given climate change. So the key role that the food system can play here. Uh, and now our next presenter is John uh, Clark, Director of International Relations and also Director General for Agriculture, European Commission. John, please. <coughs> Thank you. Thank you and uh, good morning, America. I've always wanted to say that. So I'm going to use the opportunity. Uh, thank you to IFPRI for this um, invitation to a very timely seminar. I was very happy with Josh Swinnon's uh, remark at the beginning that he, he noted that we've just um, adopted the new financial framework for the European Union. In fact, um, we, we said to, to Mrs. Merkel and Mr. Macron and others that we have this IFPRI seminar coming up in a couple of days, so can they please get that together and get the financial framework finished in time for the IFPRI seminar? And they listened to us, so I'm very glad about that. Um, now, Sabine um, uh, has explained the, the, the basics of the farm to fork strategy, um, explained that it's, it's how we intend to translate the Green Deal in the farming and food sector. And I won't uh, uh, go over anything that she said. I would just like to make, I, say, I would say, share with you three um, rather different observations. The first is that, as you may have gathered, this is um, intended to be a very holistic food systems strategy. And that in itself is very innovative for the European Union to have this holistic approach in, in policy terms. But it's also very innovative when it comes to our, our governance. Uh, you see today, there are, and, and, and Joswin had mentioned it, there are, there are three uh, different uh, commission departments sitting together, uh, 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 talking about a, a, a common uh, policy goal. Um, this is a, would be unheard of. 10 years ago, frankly. Yeah? If, we, if we had been sitting together, it would have been to uh, watch each other's backs or spy on each other. Today, we sit together as a Team Europe, uh, implementing, uh, presenting, strategizing on a common European policy. So that's a very big uh, governance innovation in, in itself. Now, on, the, on the, um, the, the substance of the strategy, uh, just a couple of, uh, of points to complement uh, what's, what's been said. Um, even though all, all participants in the food chain will be uh, in, implicated in this strategy, it's very evident that the farmers will have a very, very big role to play. And if you look at the different targets, uh, many of which may become legislation in the years to come, uh, most of them re relate to what farmers will have to do, whether it's uh, the, the, the movement of, of, of organics from today's 8% of land to 25%, whether it's reducing pesticides by 50%, um, uh, fertilizers by 20%, um, increasing animal welfare standards, uh, and, and, and uh, not least uh, re re removing up to 10% of agricultural land out of production uh, into landscape and, and biodiversity uh, 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 restoration. These are uh, targets that the farmers will have to uh, meet. Now, um, some of them are, are rather um, in trepidation of this, but uh, frankly, uh, we have to see this as a very big opportunity for the farming sector in Europe to become part of the, the famous solution, not part of the problem, as they tend to be regarded. That is, of course, very simplistic. Um, we, 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 Europe has not been doing as bad as, as one might think when it comes to environmental and climate change. Uh, action. Uh, of all the major agricultural regions in the world, uh, we are the only one which has, at the same, in the last 30 years, at the same time increased uh, production and uh, productivity while actually re reducing greenhouse gas emissions. Every other uh, major agricultural region has either uh, increased emissions or, at the best, maintained the level while uh, in, uh, re reducing production. So, uh, with it, our, our story is not so bad, but having said that, we can uh, improve uh, considerably, and the strategy will help us to do that, notably on, on recovery of biodiversity, uh, improvement of soil and water quality, and, and reduction of methane emissions in, in, in livestock. And uh, our, our farmers will be helped with that, 
the new CAP, which is uh, soon to be uh, passed by the legislators in Europe, uh, will provide uh, considerable funding uh, for farmers to meet the, the goals of the farm to fork strategy and the, the biodiversity strategy. About 40% of the funding to farmers will be devoted to uh, meeting environmental and climate change goals. And the, the European taxpayer and the farmers understand that this is the, if you like, the deal. Uh, public money goes to support the delivery of public goods. So I, I think our farmers are, uh, are up to speed when it comes to uh, meeting these challenges. Uh, a last word on the, on the, the, the rather important international dimension. Uh, even though the Farm to Fork strategy is, is primarily a European uh, strategy, uh, of course, we want uh, other regions and countries to um, follow our, our, our example, or at least take comparable uh, steps. Frankly, there, there is, you know, for our farmers, there's an issue of the level playing field. But uh, for, more generally, for, for us as, as, as policymakers, um, we want to see uh, a holistic food systems approach more globally uh, adopted, not least uh, in, 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 uh, in preparation for the very important UN Food Systems Summit next year. Frankly, it's, it's, it's about the, the global nature of the challenge. There, there is little uh, point in Europe, uh, which represents 10% of, of global emissions and is decreasing, little point in Europe being, being the oasis of sustainability in a sea of unsustainable practices. We need to ensure that uh, all our partners are, are taking similar steps because um, climate change, environment, biodiversity loss, pollution, the, these, these do, do not respect national boundaries. So our success is really tied up with the success of others. So we'll be working very hard uh, in the uh, months ahead uh, through our trade agreements, the sustainable chapters of the trade agreements, through the UN system, working with our partners to try to have a collective uh, increase and improvement in our sustainability of our food and farming uh, systems. And we will be using also our development cooperation instruments to help developing countries in particular meet the higher standards for, for food that we will be progressively implementing uh, in, the, in the years ahead in Europe. So I think it's overall, it's a very um, innovative and exciting uh, prospect and project for the years to come, both in Europe and, and globally. Thank you, John. Thank you very much for um, highlighting also the farmer's role in um, being the solution and not the problem and finding ways to increase productivity while keeping profitability and being environmentally responsible. And also um, how this interacts with the rest of the world through trade that you just mentioned that. So thank you very much for that. And now our next speaker is Umberto Delgado Rosa. He is the Director of Natural Capital, Director General for Environment, and European Commission. Umberto. Thank you, Valeria, and thank you, everyone listening. I will use some very few slides to drive you in my five minutes on the biodiversity strategy for 2030. But my first comment is, well, the EU Green Deal is a novelty, novelty in itself but it does treat biodiversity a par with climate change in terms of importance for global sustainability. And that's kind of a novelty. Can I have next slide, please? So my question is, how come did biodiversity get into real politics, becoming more important almost as much as climate change? Well, I would say there's more than one reason, one of which was the global assessment of 2019 by the Intergovernmental Panel on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services. It did give us this headline of one million species at risk and no one likes um, uh, species extinctions. It also identified and ranked the indirect and direct drivers of loss that uh, has attracted some attention. But I would also add, you know, I think many uh, Europeans uh, have began to feel a kind of encirclement of pollution or unnaturalness around them, be it from plastic in the ocean, from uh, mega forest fires everywhere, including in Europe, and very especially also bugs. The decline of insects and pollinators strikes the chord in Europeans. It links to their perception of farmland use, of, of food, etc. So I think insects indeed have helped. Can I have next slide, please? 
So how come did we have a biodiversity strategy together with the farm to fork strategy amidst a pandemia? Well, the reasons are more or less clear. First, biodiversity loss is indeed a key stress for humanity. We are strictly dependent of nature for food, water, air, and many other things that we often forget. Then there's the economic angle with this evidence that the economy depends on nature. If you look to the World Economic Forum and their global risk assessment every year, biodiversity loss uh, ranks higher as a threat. Then, as I already referred this, this link climate change biodiversity, two sides of the same coin, and the link to the pandemics that we now know as these viral outbreaks have a link to the mismanagement and misuse of nature that we often do. And also in Europe, we have understood that we could address biodiversity as an element for the recovery. The next slide, please. And now, I won't go into everything in the 20 plus pages of the biodiversity strategy. These are the main four chapters. But to tell you a bit on the first one, on protect nature, I think what will attract attention is the quantification and the ambition. I actually do think we have an ambitious biodiversity strategy in our hands. So on nature protection, what we announce is the aim to get to 30% of European land and sea protected. And one third of these 30% should be strict protection, which is not necessarily a don't go, don't touch, but is very likely a don't extract. Uh, and also that these protected areas should be effectively managed and properly connected. The second major chapter is on restoring nature, and we do present a rather ambitious EU nature restoration plan, which is actually often quantified uh, with a measurability of the announced targets and commitments, and that addresses the main drivers of direct loss. So first and foremost, land and sea use change, then overexploitation, then climate change in itself, then pollution of all sorts, and invasive alien species. So if you look into it, you will find there first, we announced for next year, for the first time ever in Europe, legally binding targets for nature restoration that will come after an impact assessment. But then you'll find provisions on agricultural land for sure, the same provisions partially as, um, as you find in farm to fork strategy, plus this 10% landscape features that John has referred to, you find provisions on soil, on forests and tree planting, on energy and bioenergy, on marine ecosystems, freshwater ecosystems, urban areas, and so forth. Uh, the next slide, please. In this next slide, what I'll show you is just a sample of some of these efforts to quantify ecosystems, biodiversity issues. I know it's far easier to measure CO2 in the atmosphere than to measure biodiversity, but we come with these quantified targets on agricultural land already referred, but for other examples, we aim at 3 billion uh, trees extra, extra trees planted in the EU under, under ecological criteria. We aim to restore 25,000 kilometers of the rivers to be free flowing and so forth. So I think this, this element of quantification does attract quite some attention and we aim also to reverse the decline of pollinators. Uh, next slide, please. Finally, we also have in the uh, not only a chapter on the enabling part of the strategy that I will uh, pass through, but we also have in the strategy what the EU aims as a position for the global deal for nature that should be obtained next year in the summit of biodiversity to be held in China. So we, we refer to that building on the EU commitments. Actually, I did not say it. The Green Deal also said we should lead as a, by example the EU. Uh, so this is pretty much what we aim with our strategy, showing this ambition and commitments. We mobilize our green diplomacy, international ocean governance. We also have this dispositions on trade policy, which is said it should support ecological transition. So we want to crack down the illegal wildlife trade. We will come with legal proposals and other measures to tackle deforestation and forest degradation from EU, EU imports. We will address climate policy, especially from the angle of nature-based solutions and international cooperation, which certainly want to have more coordination, including so that the 
other uh, multilateral environmental agreements can be, can add up and reinforce each other uh, towards uh, biodiversity. I think my very final slide is more a thank you and some links. So I hope I've stayed grossly in the five minutes. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much, um, Roberto, for this, um, for emphasizing the importance of biodiversity and the elements of the biodiversity strategy. I just would like to highlight a couple of uh, common points that were raised by the three uh, panelists, which is the novelty uh, in way of the, the set it up as a very holistic uh, point of view, the governance and including biodiversity in this green deal. Also the farmer's role in dealing with this. And the last one is that it covers the whole food system. So with this, um, I would like to move to, uh, first of all, I would like to remind you all um, of that you can submit your brief questions on ifpre.org or Facebook or LinkedIn, YouTube, or by using the hashtag AskIfpre on Twitter. Uh, we will come into the Q&A session uh, following this uh, discussion with the presenters. So the first thing I would like to do is to ask uh, John um, uh, one question related with what does the European Union's new common agricultural policy take into account the highly ambitious targets of the farm to fork and biodiversity strategies. So um, John, if you can start the discussion. Yeah, sure. Um, I think if the question is, you know, does the, the new CAP integrate the Green Deal and the farm to fork and so on? I think the, the answer would be a, a, a heavily qualified yes. Um, you know, as I said in my introductory remarks, the, the European agriculture sector is not performing so badly when it comes to uh, environment, climate change and so on, but uh, obviously there is a lot of room for improvement, uh, notably on, on biodiversity loss, uh, water and soil quality and, and greenhouse gas emission um, reductions. Um, the, the, the new CAP is, is, uh, is very well equipped to um, integrate the, the quite ambitious targets that we've uh, heard about in the Farm to Fork and the, and the Biodiversity Strategy. Let me explain why. Unlike previous um, agricultural policies, the new one uh, is also very innovative, innovative in, in the sense that it is not at all uh, prescriptive. Uh, the, the current policy and the previous ones have been very, very prescriptive in the sense that they, they lay down the rules for how, how wide a hedge has to be uh, um, how, how, how close to a riverbank can you grow uh, uh, maize, etc. Yeah? The, the, the new policy um, sets broad uh, objectives, targets, performance targets, and it uh, delegates to member states the, the way in which they will achieve those targets. Uh, and so uh, each member state, uh, and they're doing it now, has to do a, a SWOT analysis uh, looking at their current uh, agricultural system and uh, where, where it uh, falls short of the, uh, the the green deal and the farm to fork and biodiversity objectives and the and the the, the higher environmental ambition in any case of the new uh, CAP and each member state has to then prepare a strategic plan showing how they will meet those different targets uh, how they will match the funding to farmers to uh, meet the targets how, and how they will monitor that uh, over over the next uh, decade. And the European Commission, for its part, uh, will will offer uh, guidance and recommendations to member states. They will and they will and we will be monitoring and and if you like negotiating with member states those strategic plans. And, and the European Commission will approve them or, or not approve them, depending on whether we believe they're going to actually meet the uh, the these uh, admittedly ambitious. Uh, targets in the in, in the strategy. So the answer is yes. The the, the flexible uh, nature of the new CAP does allow us to uh, 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 achieve and integrate the farm to fork strategies uh, and and the the biodiversity strategy. And um, the the uh, amount of funding to the farming sector uh, will be um, not as much as they would like. Never is farmers are never never happy about the amount of money they get, but 
uh, we have we have got off quite uh, well, I, I would say, with the uh, the new financial framework. Um, whether you talk about real terms or nominal terms, we're, we're we're about the same as the past, very slightly less, but but uh, a reasonable budget allocation, and about forty percent of that at least uh, will be devoted to environmental and climate change change objectives, and that is uh, that is understood by the farming uh, community. Um, but the in in three or four areas. Uh, we are explicitly injecting some new uh, uh, issues into the, the, the CAP. For example, uh, we are uh, proposing to make uh, farmers' echo schemes compulsory and be more clear about what kind of echo schemes can attract uh, CAP funding. Uh, we are asking the member states to provide specific ideas on how they will improve animal welfare on the farm and reduce antibiotic use and we'll also ask member states how they're going to encourage um, farmers to organize into producer groups and therefore have a stronger leverage in the in the food chain and last but not least we will have a, a public dialogue with each member state in the course of their preparation of these national strategic plans uh, to so the, the whole all stakeholders all the public can actually debate whether the member state in question is integrating the green deal properly into their, their new CAP plans. And those dialogues will be starting uh, after the summer. Thank you very much. And Bert, I just would like to follow up uh, these um, comments uh, from John. And I would like to ask you if you can comment a little bit on how the biodiversity strategy connects directly to the farm to fork strategy and the CAP. Thank you. Well, thanks for the question. As John said in the beginning, the Green Deal is rather holistic on making us work together. And indeed, the biodiversity strategy says that the, itself, the farm to fork strategy and the common agriculture policy are, are to work in tandem. By the way, I'm not sure if it was already said, we did ca came out at the same time as both strategies with a staff working document, as we call it. Uh, analyzing how far the common agriculture policy proposal uh, aligns with the Green Deal. In the conclusion, it does fully, provided the ambition of the proposal is kept by the co-legislators, the Council and the Parliament. So with this said, um, the elements within the uh, common agriculture policy can be perfectly tuned by the member states in their flexibility using these new instruments to deliver on the targets of farm to fork and biodiversity. For instance, these eco schemes can be purely devised nationally to address some of these targets we have been, we have been discussing. They can also be devised to be oriented towards being results-based payment schemes when the farmer is not rewarded only by the number of hectares or the production of food or, or fiber, but let's imagine the number of birds nests or the diversity of butterflies, or whatever indicator we see fit for the targets. So I do think the sustainable practices that are subjacent to the, both strategies, precision farming, agroecology in general, or organic farming in particular, agroforestry, low intensive grassland, extensive practices, all of them can be fostered through the, through the CAP strategic plans. And not forgetting that the European Commission is foreseen to have an important role of the, in the approval of the member states' um, strategic plans. So for sure, we'll make sure that these targets are taking, taken into account. And to just give another element, these 10% landscape features to be brought into farmland, which are non-productive per se, they do have a benefit also for productivity because when you have buffer strips, rotational fallow land, edges, trees, terrace walls, ponds coming in, you are providing habitats to begin with for pollinators, which is uh, pollination is an ecosystem service everyone understands, but you'll have better soil, better water. So in the long run, that will also compensate production in itself. Thank you. Thank you very much. And now I would like to switch a little bit this conversation and ask Hio if he can uh, comment on what has the COVID-19 crisis shown about the resilience of the agri-food supply chain? And do you think that the uh, farm to fork and biodiversity strategies reflect the lessons learned during this crisis? Thank you. 
Um, thank you, much. thank you very much, Valeria. The well, the first part of the question alone is it's a very big question, right? Uh, I would say I'm going to read our book. We have a book coming out next week on COVID-19 and the global uh, food systems, food security. So I'm just using my 30 seconds here to advertise uh, this book. Uh, what we've learned, okay, is that if you look globally, that COVID-19 impacts on, on every, all aspects of life are very heterogeneous. And on some uh, aspects of life, they've had a tremendous impact on others, much less. And that's also true if you look at food systems. Some of our food systems have been quite resilient, actually, to the COVID-19 outbreak. Some have not. And so if you look at the two major weaknesses, I think, to put, I mean, there's many, many more things, but just in, in a minute and a half here, one is basically income effects, right? So the economic recession has had a tremendous impact on food consumption, on, on consumers' access to food, particularly for poor people. The second effect is that certain elements, certain nodes of our value chains of our food system have been disrupted heavily. And these are typically the labor-intensive nodes of the value chain. And so a lot of people are working right now, both small uh, smallholder farmers, small SME food systems, uh, food companies, I mean multinationals, on addressing these weaknesses right now. And so the regulatory uh, changes are an important thing of that. Is the general, well, if you look at what happened, for example, in the 1990s in the transition process in Eastern Europe, you had major breakdowns of the food system, but they were targeted to the, the capital intensive parts of the food system, not the labor intensive ones. And so I think the future shocks may affect different nodes of, of the food system. So the key point is to be aware that resilience is really important and to make it broadly resilient, not to uh, very specific shocks. And I think if I heard the presentations right now and I read the report, I think that is clearly there. The, uh, all the speakers have emphasized to basically try to develop a system which basically makes that you can have a win-win-win situations, wins in terms of sustainability, in terms of resilience, in terms of uh, better diets, health effects, and economic sustainability as well, right? Incomes for the farms, et cetera. Now, in reality, in life, most of these things are very difficult. Okay? There's always there's often trade-offs, et cetera. But I think being aware of this and trying to set up policy systems that at least try to achieve this, I think that's a major uh, step forward. Thank you. Thank you, Leo, very much for this. And Sabine, I would like to um, to ask you one question um, related with, you said that all actors in the food chain needs to be engaged in the transition towards a more sustainable food system. So how are you going to do that? Uh, if you can just highlight the two uh, main points that you would like to highlight there. And also, John mentioned a little bit about the commitments, if they are going to be uh, done by legislation or voluntary commitments. So if you can also comment on that very shortly. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much indeed for this uh, for this question. Um, yes, all actors have to have to play a role, and um, what we are looking it at is really a mix of measures. Let me take um, one aspect of the of the strategy, which deals with sustainable consumption. Just by way of background, um, you know, in Europe we unfortunately have a unsustainable food consumption pattern. Um, you may or may not know that um, we have not managed to reverse the rising obesity trend, including on children. More than half of our adult population is overweight. Um, at the same time, um, we are um, wasting food. Um, 20, roughly 20% of the, the food is wasted in the EU. Um, we know that the diets of the EU population are not at all in line with the recommendations of member states. They are too high in salt, in, in fat, in sugar. They are too much um, animal-based and not sufficiently plant-based. So we clearly have a pattern of unsustainable food consumption. Now, everybody will understand that it is basically not possible to regulate into the fridge and the mouth of the consumer. Um, you know, it is an area where um, a lot of... Um, voluntary action has to happen on the part of the consumer, but what we can do is to make the food environment much more favorable for uh, healthy and more sustainable consumption. And there I give you a few examples how we can do that. 
For example, um, we will be uh, looking at introducing labeling, very clear, very, um, very easily uh, understandable front of pack nutrition labeling so that the consumer um, knows about the properties of their food, whether that is basically healthy or not. This would be uh, achieved through legislative um, provisions because here in the EU we have a harmonized food um, labeling system so um, that we would like to introduce. On the other hand, we would like to introduce a code of conduct for um, companies um, uh, in, the, in the retail sector about um, responsible marketing behavior. So we would like with this code, which would be a voluntary framework, um, like to set out um, the criteria, the frame on how to market sustainably, sustainable products and how to market in a responsible way. We are also going to launch reformulation or relaunch or reinforce the launch of reformulation initiatives where we would like to see the players in uh, food manufacturing to voluntarily initially uh, commit to further reformulation towards less sugar, less salt, um, less, less fat and overall a better profile of the products. And uh, maybe the, the final example I would like to give, and all these examples are part of the, the action plan. Um, we would also like to uh, set up criteria for sustainable food procurement. So what is it that uh, facilitate, what are the criteria that uh, we can say this is sustainably procured food? As you know, a lot of food is consumed in institutional settings and, um, uh, you know, canteens and so on and so forth. Um, the people, the, the consumers are helped by the offers that will be made to them in these institutional settings. And we would like with such a framework for criteria for sustainable food procurement, we would like to support member states, we would like to support actors private actors, canteen operators, uh, the, the hospitality sector, to make this move towards more sustainability and help them and guide them along. So in brief, the answer is we, we will resort to a mix of measures. Um, by the way, John uh, referred to the very important instrument of the common agricultural policy to, to steer farmers and their, their farming um, habits and behaviors. So we will resort to a, a very um, diverse mix of um, measures that are adjusted to the problem at hand and to the um, and where we think we get a solution and a shift as quickly as possible. Thank you. Thank you, Sabine, very much. And uh, now, um, Umberto, I would like to um, um, ask you one quick one. You put a lot of emphasis on the European Union's nature restoration plan. What implications? does that have for a sustainable food system? And more than anything, does this also include uh, or address this marine food? Thank you. Well, thanks for the question, because I actually think that restoration is a very important keyword. You know, no one can build a political agenda based on negative message only. So in biodiversity and nature protection, restoration brings this positive element that we can often put back what we have lost, except if, we have allowed extinctions to, to come in. And also nature is generous and often pays back. So um, what happens in Europe, the relation with the food system is, well, we have many degraded ecosystems in Europe, uh, including those that are used for food production. And that's in my view, because we are often have come too far in this model of intensifying a monoculture through so pumping in um, chemical inputs. Uh, so. Uh, what you find in the nature restoration plan is two kinds of restoration. One is the passive restoration that arises from reducing the pressure. For instance, if you reduce pesticides, if you bring in agroecology, or if you reduce excess nutrients from fertilizers, that allows the restoration. And you also find what can be called active restoration, which is when you actively put nature back 
be it for instance, the landscape features that we have referred for farmland or the, the, the tree planting that by the way, can be linked with agroforestry. So either from the passive side of restoration or the active side of restoration, one can derive allowing due time also benefits for sustainable food. In relation to marine food, that's quite an important point in the biodiversity strategy, not least because we, DG Environment, are under the same commissioner as DG uh, Mare, uh, responsible for oceans. So I would say there first, one element is the restoration of marine ecosystems, and that's linked also with marine protected areas. If you bring in strict protection, what do you get? You get bigger fish. If you get bigger fish, that means more eggs, more larvae, more fish to be fished elsewhere. So that's one of the elements. We also aim to sustainable harvesting, first zero tolerance to illegal practices, and also fully going into maximum sustainable yield of fish resources. And we will come up with a uh, specific action plan for fishery resources and marine ecosystems in the context of our common fisheries policy, which is itself ecosystem based. Thank you. Thank you very much. And um, John, you emphasize quite a lot in your presentation the important role of farmers and, and the bigger role that they play in the uh, uh, farm uh, to fork strategy. So, can you just tell us a little bit? Um, we kind of understand that they have expressed the farmers' concerns about meeting the ambitions uh, in it. So can you comment on their reaction and what's their point of view? Yeah, sure. Uh, I think their, their uh, reactions have been mixed. It, it's, it's quite true. There is some uh, worry amongst some farm groups, not all, and I'll come back to that, basically for three reasons. Uh, the first is that I think some farmers or farm farmer groups are worried that the uh, the ambitious targets that are, are being set are going to cost them a lot of money to meet. They, they don't have the money to, to, to meet those targets. So it, it implies a lot of cost um, on, and, and more regulation. And, and that can lead to a, a drop in their uh, income. So it's a simple issue of, of, um, of competitiveness. Secondly, I think there's a, a feeling among some farmers in Europe that they're, they are, they're not playing on a level playing field. Yeah. Uh, they will have to have much higher environmental animal welfare, other standards, whereas their competitors in, in the Americas or Asia or anywhere else will not have to meet those high standards. Therefore, they can undercut them uh, cost-wise. So there's a level playing field concern, which I think is very real. And thirdly, um, I think that the farmers feel, some farmers feel that they are shouldering most of the responsibility uh, for the farm and fork. Um, I think that is that is misguided, frankly. Um, the, the the strategy will require a contribution from every player in the in the food chain, as Sabine has, has suggested. Not just the farmers, but also the uh, food processors, the energy sector, the transport sector, retailers, the scientific community, and above all, the consumers. Yeah. This so this is it is as much about the fork as it is about the farm. Um, so, but, you know, there are these concerns uh, from, from some farmers. At the same time, many farmers, and I, I've spoken to some groups in the, in, in the recent uh, weeks, are, are kind of, uh, you know, uh, looking forward to the challenge. Yeah, they, they, farmers are very, are very resilient, versatile people. They, they face challenges on a daily basis, climate and, and, and all sorts of things. And uh, they see this as an opportunity to actually be in the vanguard of, of environmental climate uh, action, and um, they're looking forward to it. And we will accompany them through the CAP, through the strategies, with funding, but also with a lot of support on guidance on innovation research, precision farming, uh, working with the research organizations to make sure that they are very well supported in this transition to a more sustainable production. And you know, uh, one, one of Europe's great um, selling points in, in international trade and, and also in Europe is that we have a very, very good reputation for um, uh, healthy, nutritious, safe uh, food. It's really our, our calling card on, on the European and global markets. And I'm, I'm quite convinced, and many farmers are also convinced, that um, if we can uh, raise our uh, sustainability profile, uh, we can actually command an even better premium for our products, going more and more uh, in the trend of high value, high quality, uh, sustainable products with a very good 
environmental uh, backstory and footprint. And in that way, the, the farmers can actually uh, increase their incomes uh, in the way they've been doing actually uh, over the last 10 years. So I think it's, it's actually a very uh, exciting prospect uh, in the medium to long term uh, to, to be a farmer in Europe uh, and to embrace the, the Green Deal uh, objectives. Thank you very much. And so, in, I would like to ask you one uh, one question, if you can answer in, in one minute. Uh, I think that one of the uh, innovative things of the Green Deal is that it's not only looking at, um, at the objective or the main goal in the future, but also looking at the transition of this. So I would like you to ask, uh, I would like you to uh, answer if you can see what is the role of innovation in the implementation of the farm to park strategy? Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much for the question. And indeed, I mean, um, this is not only a strategy that um, has basically demands and objectives, it also sets out the enablers. And the enablers towards this transition are very much focused around research, innovation, knowledge, advice. And um, already John, in his previous answer, he referred to innovation, precision farming as, as one important aspect for farmers in particular to, to make this transition. And um, we do regard innovation and our capacity um, in the food system to innovate um, as really one of the key enablers um, for this transition. That's why also quite a substantive part of the EU research budget, which in itself is not, not small, um, uh, is dedicated towards research and innovation on food, in, on the bioeconomy, on natural resources, agriculture, fisheries. We are talking here in of, of uh, 10, 10 billion plus um, funding. Um, I just want to give uh, one or two examples. We are talking about um, greenhouse gas emissions in, in agriculture. We have a very innovative uh, feed additive industry and we know that with um, suitable feed additives we can cut the methane emissions of ruminants substantially. I mean, there, there are huge figures, there's huge potential out there. So these are um, aspects of innovation that are really crucial. We ask our farmers to cut back on the on the use and the, the um, related risk of chemical pesticides. We already see that the industry has understood that call. So more around half of the new applications that we are seeing on, on plant protection products concern either biological solutions or what we call low risk pesticides. So if we clearly formulate what type of innovation we want, um, it is that the private actors are also following suit. The same on, on plant breeding. I mean, there is a huge potential out there, for example, reduction of water use for more um, resilience or more resistance towards um, plant pests. So in short and surely beyond my one minute, um, innovation is key, it is crucial the same as transferring knowledge about that innovation and how to use it across the food chain. Thank you. Thank you, Zemin. And Yo, I would like to ask you, um, how do you see or what does the farm to fork and strategies implied for the EU's agri-food trade with the rest of the world? Do you see a challenge or opportunity for developing countries in this? Thanks. Um, both. Uh... It's definitely going to have an impact on trade. I mean, it's hard to imagine it would it would not have an impact on trade. I think now, but to to give a bit of a perspective on this, I think the sort of biodiversity uh, regulations now and the farm to food uh, uh, regulations certainly, which I, I know better, is they're building. They're not just coming out of uh, falling out of the air. Sometimes, I mean, the EU introduced in 2002 a major new food regulation, the food law. And that also had already a farm to food uh, perspective. Okay, what we have now is going much further, etc. But already then there was there's been a huge discussion over the past 15 years on how these regulations in the EU have affected global food chains, trade, etc. And this goes back. I mean, the, the the essence of that is the role of standards, whether they are catalysts to trade 
or whether they are barriers to trade, okay, whether food standards are essentially non-tariff barriers in, in WTO speak, if you want, okay? And so there's a lot of research which has been done on that. I personally have been involved with my research group quite a bit, and it seems to be empirical evidence, it depends, okay? Some of them actually stimulate trade because they reduce transaction costs, make it easier. It also comes back to John's point on the level playing field, the concern from people inside uh, the EU farmers, but there's also concern from uh, <clears throat> farmers outside the EU, whether the market will be restricted there. Okay, and I think the role of the private sector is actually very important here. I mean, both Sean and Sabine emphasized this, but a lot of the trade is not done by, I mean, most of the trade is not by the government, it's done by the private sectors, and they follow the EU regulations because they have to, but they have also their own private standards, and often they are basically tougher even than the EU regulations. So that's very important. And my final point here is that there's been quite a bit of work going on at the OECD and also at IFPRI on seeing to what extent trade policies the, <clears throat> are they are coherent in terms of reducing market distortions and uh, in reducing greenhouse gas emissions. And again, it depends on the instruments, but the good news is that the core of the common agriculture policy, which is the decoupled farm subsidies, seem to have benefits on, on both of these. And so that's a, that's a, a nice way, a nice base to start on, I think, for, the, for going further. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I would like to, uh, to ask uh, Umberto one question raised by uh, Fallon Hayes, and it is, how is the European Green Deal supporting farmers to make this change? Thanks. Well, it's largely through the common agriculture policy, which indeed is a big chunk of the EU financing. And there have been in the last years, the last reforms of the common agriculture policy, there were already moves towards greening it. We have a, a, the current greening that has delivered to a certain extent, but uh, uh, actually the proposal of the Commission for the next common agriculture policy, as John already said, on bringing by one side more flexibility to the member states, but also on linking more explicitly the cap with the EU regulations on environment and climate kind of pre-prepared the way for what then kicked in the Green Deal. So uh, the farmers that have these fears that John has referred, notably on their income, the, the, all the instruments are there in the hands of the uh, member states with a role for the commission to ensure that they can indeed be supported in this transition towards sustainability that in the end is fundamental for, the, for themselves. When you have a degraded soil, uh, water or nature, it's uh, the farmer that suffers for, first and foremost. So we have a very, um, a lot of empathy for the farmer's role. We need them, we will support them. Thank you very much. And then it is a question for John. And uh, this question is raised by Nelson Ilescas from INAI Foundation Argentina. And he says, since you mentioned the payment of subsidies to European farmers justified by the public goods they generate, are you also planning to pay aid to farmers in the rest of the world who do the same, especially considering that uh, green gas uh, emissions do not respect borders? Are they correctly pointed out? Thank you. If you can answer in one minute, thanks. Well, thanks for the, 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 the uh, public support. Uh, the, the public investment, if you like, to farmers is, is for European farmers. Uh, but um, we will certainly, through our um, development policy instruments, uh, be um, supporting uh, farmers in developing countries to meet European standards. We've done it already. And uh, for the, the vast majority of our development partners in the developing world, uh, the agriculture sector is, is a priority for them because it, it, it's the biggest uh, source of, uh, of, of job creation uh, and, and the, uh, the economy of many countries and uh, it's a priority for them. So we will continue to do that uh, in, the, in the next um, development programming cycle. Uh, and, uh, and certainly uh, provided that our developing country uh, partners wish to see uh, support for uh, their agricultural sectors, we will, we will provide it. Uh, in particular, uh, to, um, to accomplish this green transition and to help uh, uh, our exporters in developing countries and uh, to, to meet any any more stringent standards that are that are introduced in in Europe. We want to do this in, in a spirit of partnership 
And Argentina, in fact, I was in discussions with the, your government yesterday, and they're very keen to work with you in the, um, on um, working together uh, to have uh, commonly agreed uh, sustainability standards, uh, notably in the, in, the, in, the, in the livestock sector. And Argentina is in a good place when it comes to that. So we'll be, we'll be working with Argentina and others to uh, ensure that they can get that uh, famous uh, sustainability label that we're going to be developing in the next uh, year, few years. Thank you very much. And uh, this is a question uh, for Sabine. So Christine asked, uh, how does the farms to fork strategy go along with the WTO idea of harmonization of food regulations? How will this influence work of the EU in Codex Alimentary? Where do you see an out? Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Christine, for, for this very relevant question. I mean, we have not been speaking about the, the international um, aspect of, of farm to fork, but it is, it is very clear that Europe wants um, really to support a global transition of, of food systems. And John said it initially, you know, it is all fine and well if Europe goes forward. And yes, we want to be uh, leading, leading by example. But we are talking of um, challenges of a global nature. So it is in the first interest of Europe, you know, to, to support a global transition, to work hard with our partners to, to discuss and to go forward on international sustainable to say international sustainability standards so we do understand as we have understood um, you know two decades ago that um, you know the work in codex for food safety for example is very very important and very beneficial for all of us globally um, we see a bit of a same approach on sustainability now I'm not quite sure whether whether codex will be really than the, um, the the forum but sustainability standards internationally supported that is really something we would be aiming up at and um, just for your information what we would like to develop is uh, a, a food labeling framework um, that would then also allow um, imported products products imported into the eu to to claim basically that they were produced uh, according to the sustainability framework and if ever we manage to have this globally agreed it would just be um, very good and would open the doors for uh, sustainably imported products open the doors that are open anyhow, but also give the possibility to, to label and advertise products as such. And that, in, in our opinion, would also provide an opportunity to be um, fairly remunerated for efforts to farm sustainably also in, in um, non-EU countries. Because what we know is that the European consumer is interested very much so, um, to, to quite some extent also prepare to, to pay, provided they are confident that they are, they are getting what they are paying for. So um, where we say we see economic opportunities for the European farming and, and fishing community, um, we also see these economic opportunities in the international community. Thank you. Thank you very much. And now um, we're running out of time, so I would like to un uh, ask uh, Yo for the last uh, two questions that they are very related to each other and they were um, brought up from two different uh, anonymous people. So the first one is um, broad reduction in inputs and increases in land under organic will damage an efficient and affordable food system. Can this strategy change to help food security? And then the second one is how do you see uh, this uh, deal uh, in international trade? How do you see it's going to be, again, challenge opportunities? It's going to be a, a good thing, bad thing. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Um, the I would like to pass the organic question on to John, if he doesn't mind, because he I think he has thought about this much longer than, than I have, and, and maybe also Umberto. 
so I know <clears throat> the general uh, issues there, but uh, it would be good to hear their views on, on how organics and, and things would fit in, in the new framework and how they see it affecting their productivity. On the, <clears throat> the impact on trade, it comes back to the points I, I, I thought I made in my last intervention, okay, and also to what uh, Sabine uh, just mentioned. The, um, I mean, it is going to be both an opportunity and a challenge, I think. I mean, when these new standards are being introduced, these are initially an, uh, challenges for the EU farmers, but if they're going to affect the requirements that have to be uh, addressed in order to export to the EU, they're going to be um, challenges for uh, farmers outside of the EU and the whole food system, the whole value chain there, okay? But typically what happens is that if you can address this, and we've seen this, numerous studies have showed this, over the past uh, 15 years of the of the standards which had been addressed already typically what you do you move from a lower value segment of the market to a higher valued segment of the market and there is basically therefore rents or, or income surplus what do you want to call it to be distributed for all the players all the agents in these value chains including the farmers in developing countries and so in that way these standards can enhance trade as well but again, it's really, it's almost like a case by case thing. It's, I don't think you can make, I mean, I've done a number of, of reviews of the literature of the study. There is no general conclusions on that. And so in the same time, they're literally at the same time challenges and opportunities. Thank you. Thank you. Um, John, do you want to just comment on less than a minute? Thank you. I'll try. Um, I think the, the organic issue is, is uh, kind of uh, symbolic of the, of the challenge. Uh, at the moment, we have 8% of uh, agriculture is organic. The aim is 25%. That's very, a very, very big increase. Um, you know, I'm going to have to be the kind of um, two-handed lawyer here, you know, on the one hand and on the, on the other hand. If, on the one hand, these targets on organics, pesticides, uh, taking land out of productivity, lead to um, less production, less productivity, uh, higher costs, uh, then um, our, our exports are going to suffer. Yeah, we will be exporting less. We'll, we'll, that's ob obvious. But if, on the other hand, uh, we, we can um, create a more universal desire uh, in, in, the, in the Americas, in the emerging economies, as well as in Europe for sustainable products, um, organic, uh, high value GIs, good environmentally sound pro pro products, high animal welfare, the lot, then I think uh, our, our trade profile will uh, will continue to be successful. We will continue to export uh, around the world. Um, I don't think they'll be, we will still need to import. That's clear. Um, Europe is not self-sufficient and should not try to be. We need a, a, a diverse uh, uh, imports. Um, countries will have to meet higher standards in the future. Uh, and if they, if they can't meet those standards, then they won't find the, the consumers in Europe, but we will help them on the way to uh, meet those standards. One thing that will not change, and, and Joss Swinnon hinted at this, is that we will maintain the, the, the market orientation of our agriculture and trade policies. Almost all our support will remain green box. We'll still be open to uh, exports and imports. We want to remain the, the biggest export and importer in the world. In fact, the, now that the UK is a third country, that adds uh, 40 billion to our export basket. So we're going to remain the biggest exporter uh, for years to come. And we've learned in the, in the COVID uh, crisis, the, the importance of not closing markets, not closing down trade. Many member states or some member states were uh, getting into, if you like, gastro protectionism, nationalism, let's uh, close down the market, let's just buy only buy locally, uh, don't trade anymore, no exports and imports. We, we prohibited that and even joined the WTO declaration with others uh, saying that we have to keep markets open because we've learned from the 2008 uh, price uh, uh, hike crisis and, and more recently from the Russian ban, that we need to have, above all, uh, diversified markets and diversified sources of supply. And that will continue. Thank you very much, uh, John, for these last um, uh, remarks. Um, well, I would like, we unfortunately run out of time. And one thing of being um, this virtual seminar is that we really need to follow and be done at this specific time. So thank you, everyone. Thank you, uh, the panelists. There was a superb uh, presentations and discussion. And thank you for joining us. Um, and we'll see you next time. Thanks. <laughs>